Good morning and welcome to District 4 Toastmasters June 2020 webinar with Roberta Geis. I'm Zucker Harris, your moderator for the day. What do people say about you when you're not in the room? Do they speak in glowing terms? Do they whisper things that you wish would stay buried under a rock? Is it possible they barely know you and have nothing to say? Having a good reputation means people know about you, they seek you out, and they laud your work and ideas to others while you make a positive impact in your field. The most effective way for you to shape your reputation throughout your career is through intentionally developing your personal brand. In her session today, our speaker, Roberta Geis, will dive deep into her ideas and processes for doing just that. Roberta is a trusted advisor to executives, consultants, and professionals on their growing their influence, shaping their reputation, and developing their personal brand so that they become known as a go-to authority. Roberta also guides small business CEOs on growth strategies and marketing. She's currently writing a book on personal branding and reputation. And when she's not advising clients, you'll find Roberta swimming in the icy waters of San Francisco Bay listening to live jazz, or out bird watching. Because she's from both Israel and the UK, she has an accent, so don't laugh too hard when she mispronounces words. And now, let's see both hands up. Give it up for Roberta Geis. Thank you very much, Zonker. As you just heard, I do swim in San Francisco Bay. If I asked you to jump in the bay with me right now, that's me in the picture with the arm raise taking almost two hours to swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco. If you're like most Toastmasters, if you're like most people, you'd likely say, no freaking way are you getting me swimming in that freezing bay. What is it that makes people shudder at the thought of swimming in the icy waters of the bay? Monsters lurking in the murky depths, great white sharks, the cold water itself, the bay is very cold and it hurts like hell, especially when you dip your toes in for the first time and you survive it. Now visualize this. You come back and dip your toes in a second time and a third, and then you notice something magical happening. It gets easier each time you expose your body to the cold water. So it is with your reputation. As you set about developing it, it gets easier with each bold action you take to become more known and visible, whether you work for an employer or for yourself. When you know your destination, you can shape your reputation. If you're like most Toastmasters, if you're like most people, a lurking fear holds you back from presenting to an audience of say a thousand prevents you from writing a blog post or creating a video because you're worried what people will think, afraid you'll fail, fear you're just wrong. It's a long list, right? If I let my lizard brain mess with me, even though I prepared for months to swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco, I would have stopped the moment I thought, I'm too cold, I'm done. Anytime you hold yourself back, your lizard brain, that little no voice in your head that gives you 1,001 reasons why you shouldn't do something, it's denying you the opportunity to make a difference in your life and in the life of others. Here is the biggest life lesson I've learned about saying no. I just arrived, from the, arrived in the US from Israel. I hadn't finished high school. In fact, I'd flunked out of three different high schools. I'd been terrified of teachers and taking tests. You know how a dog senses you're scared of dogs? As you approach, they growl and snarl at you. And to me, my teachers growled and snarled when I got it wrong, and I got a lot wrong. So here I was in San Francisco, in my 20s, new to the country with no marketable skills, looking for anyone to give me a job. And Bill Abbott gave me a job. He gave me a job washing underwear for actors in a stage version of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Remember that film? This was before the film was even made. 
Bill was a local radio news announcer, about 20 years older than me. He was tall, he was lanky, confident, and had a deep, smooth voice. And he got straight to the point. You're wasting your potential, Roberta. If you want to get anywhere in life, you've got to get an education. Now I'm thinking to myself, Bill doesn't get it. I'm terrified of teachers and taking tests. <laughs> what I said to him was, no way, Bill, I can't go to school. It'll never work out. He persisted. Listen to what you're saying. You're telling yourself you can't do it. What if you told yourself you could? What if I told myself I could? No one had ever suggested anything like that to me. It hit like a bolt of lightning. I ran to the closest yellow pages I could get my hands on to look for schools. For those of you of a certain age, back then the internet was contained in a big fat print directory of thin yellow pages from the phone company. I poured through page after yellow page looking for schools for adult learners. Fast forward three months and I got my GED adult high school equivalency, which led to going to college, then 20 years later led to grad school. The biggest life lesson I learned from Bill, listen. Because when you listen, you can change your life. My whole life changed that first day in adult high school because I knew I had a future. When you see your destination, you can shape your reputation. We're going to cover three core areas that together are going to help you rock your personal brand and shape your reputation. So first, we'll review the five W's of reputation. Then we'll dive into personal branding traits. And this is about mindset and what the traits will actually do for you. And the place where the rubber really meets the road is the seven steps to build your personal brand. And we're also going to look at the science of how content goes viral. Fear can lurk in inopportune places and at inopportune times. A client of mine wanted to be more visible with her within her organization. Although she successfully led a tech team, she wasn't known as an authority in her field. I saw an opportunity for her to get some much needed visibility when the Microsoft Windows 7 cyber hack happened. That was back in 2017. I got straight to the point. You can write an opinion piece. It's a great opportunity. She was having none of it. Who, me? Who am I to write it? But she was qualified to write the piece. And her lizard brain was telling her she'd be viewed as an imposter. I persisted. She agreed to let me help her write it. And we got it published in the San Francisco Chronicle. And the day it published, she became an instant celebrity. She elevated her standing within her organization and in her industry. Leadership and other colleagues now saw her as a credible authority because when you know your destination, you can shape your reputation. Which now brings us to the five W's of reputation. I just need to clean something off my screen here. There we go. Now I can see the whole thing. What is reputation? Can I have the first bullet, please? Thank you, lovely Katrina. The, your reputation is the promise you make about your professional ability and performance. You know, what you do. It's what I know about you. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's the results you achieve for a client or for your employer. How do you make me feel? What do I experience interacting with you? How credible do I think you are? Do I trust you? And so on. Why reputation matters? Well, clients and employers go with a winner. You earn their trust. It gives you a competitive advantage. Reputation impacts your client or your employer because you're a big part of their success. And it impacts you because it's your success as well. A good reputation is going to confer 
many benefits. Now, when you should act is, well, when you need to build your reputation. Perhaps you're unknown or we can't easily find you online. And of course, you want to rep represent yourself in the best light possible. Another time to act is in the unlikely situation that you've got some bad reputation going on. But if that does happen and you are at fault, just acknowledge the error and take control. And if the information isn't true, then there are ways you can get it removed. And then finally, where to establish your personal brand footprint, or as we're going to be talking about later, your thought leadership footprint as well, go where the people or prospects are who you want to get in front of. So now we're going to look at some of these traits. Let's look at another story here. A client was referred to me recently because she wanted to establish her personal brand. When we first talked, she said, I know I need a personal brand, but I don't really know what that is or what it means. That was a really good comment because the term personal brand is thrown around a lot these days. And we're about to put a face on it, understand what it's about, why you need a personal brand and how to go about developing it for yourself so that you stand out and that you end up with a robust, enviable reputation. It starts with understanding personal branding traits and how they'll take you where you want to go. When you see your destination, you can shape your reputation. Your personal brand is the sum total of how you want to be perceived and how we actually remember you. So as we said, it's made up of a number of traits and characteristics. And the first trait here is that you want to have an intentional representation of yourself. This is your mindset about how you show up in the world. Do you convey an executive presence and authority? How do you want people to perceive you? Of course, you want them to listen to you. So all of these things about showing up, whether it's in a door when we're physical or online, when we're here, here on Zoom and virtually, it doesn't matter where it is. We need to really get a sense that we have someone in front of us who knows some things and we want to know what you know. Now, understand that you control all of this 100%. One last item in, in being intentional about all of this is it's also about what you want to be known for. Your reputation, on the other hand, is our perceptions of you, what we say about you when you're not in the room. You can't control your reputation. You can, however, work on aligning what you intend to project about yourself, that authority and executive presence, and our perception of you. So ideally, those two, those two things are going to actually come together. Thought leadership, as a thought leader, you influence others with your ideas and your actions. You change the way others think and behave. And really, the most important piece of this is that you're going to help shape the world as you want it to be. That is the domain of thought leadership. Now on values, here you're going to showcase your professional and personal philosophy and what you stand for. You convey your value in your messaging, meaning all of the words and ideas that you put out when you're describing yourself to somebody, whether, it, whether it's verbally or in writing. The platform is the various channels and media where you present your expert ideas, and that could be writing about what you know, presenting, you know, like we're doing here today, content video, publicity, and all kinds of other ways that you can be visible. And this part is something we're going to spend a little more time on. Personal branding should serve a bigger purpose, a purpose bigger than yourself. I like to think of each of us as messengers. Our purpose is to make a difference in other people's lives and to make them better off. And in the end, to make the world a better place. Right, so let's turn these seven traits into the seven steps to develop your personal brand 
and rock your reputation. Like I said, we're going to start with personal brand purpose and spend a little more time on it because it undergirds your reputation and how people see you. You may remember Malala. She's the young Pakistani woman who almost got herself killed by a Taliban gunman for wanting all girls to get an education. Think about that. Lose your life, almost lose your life because of this deep passion that you have. And she was only 15 at the time. And at that tender age, Malala saw how young girls were being forced into marriage before they'd even finished elementary school. Unfortunately, traditions placed low value on girls and still do. And Malala was hell-bent to change the status quo. She wrote a book and very famously won the Nobel Peace Prize for her extensive effort. And now she's giving keynotes around the world on her work and to rally support for her cause. You don't have to go global uh, with your ideas. It can be within your profession, your industry, your place of work, or even your community. The important thing though to remember is that purpose, it's about something bigger than yourself. Employers or clients don't hire you for what you do. They hire you for the value you'll bring to them. There's a wonderful author by the name of Simon Sinek and you may be familiar with his work, his landmark book, Start With Why. He says to us that Dr. Martin Luther King didn't give us the I have a plan speech. He gave us the I have a dream speech. Think about it. An employer or a client paying for the value you bring to them, how you make them better off by helping them fulfill their vision. From the big macro of a huge speech impacting society, even down to the level, not even down, but scale to the level of the sphere that you operate in, you can still aim to make a huge difference. And you need to be able to effectively communicate how you'll make people better off. Another way to looking at purpose is the transformation that you want to see in others. Think of yourself not only as a doer of things, but as a messenger of ideas that are so important that you've got to just unleash, unleash them to make people better off and to change the way they think or behave. You can be that messenger, regardless of the kind of work you do or your job title. Now, I want us to do an exercise where you're going to uncover your purpose or if you think you've already got a purpose, let's, let's go in and fine tune it. So write down, I believe we're going to do this in the chat. How do you make others better off either right now or how you'd like to make others better off in the future? So we're going to take two minutes and I'm looking at the chat window here to see, all right. How did introverts build their brand? Very good question. You'll see at the end why that's a very relevant question. Okay, bring out people's potential. As a speech pathologist, I help others with their communication skills. Zonka says I'm mentoring others. And when we mentor others, we're doing it so that, and then your purpose is the answer that comes after the so that. What's that transformation? How are they changed as a result of the mentoring? I empower women. That just went off the screen, so I can't quite see it now. It's going very fast. Let's see if I can expand my chat screen a little bit. By passing on my knowledge and inspiring others. Oh, it's going so fast. I make baby products. I've been told I'm a good teacher. I'd like to continue to teach more, but I don't know exactly how to do this or in what capacity. I'm a conduit to help and bless others. Aiding others to express themselves. Share the path to continuous learning with others. Let's see if I can see a little bit more of the screen here. Beth, so nice to see you here. 
improve the environment that all of your startups are growing in. Learn skills and knowledge from others who taught me and I mentor others to teach them skills and knowledge. Thank you, Zonku, you got that. So that. I want to help others secure, grow and protect their financial lives and not be ruled by money. What a wonderful purpose that is, not to be ruled by money. And just when you're back out of that, all of the things that you do and say that are going to help people not be ruled by money. Peer career support, providing career guidance and supervised postgrad thesis projects so that, so in helping all of that, how are the people you help changed as a result of that career advice? I help those who are busy at their work invest in real estate and attain their financial goals and dreams. We could even put a so that onto the end of that as well. What happens when dreams are fulfilled? We can keep peeling off the layers, so that, so that, so that. And you can do this exercise yourself. Keep ask, asking yourself, so that, and then answer. So that, and answer again. You'll be amazed how far out it'll take you in terms of the impact that you're making. Perhaps it's the work that you're doing, and it's a so that. Or it's an idea that you have, and it's a so that. There's no limit to how many so that answers you can come up with. Stuart, hello Stuart, I'll, I help bring humanity to technology so that products we make serve a real human need and that is Dolby serving a real human need and indeed to help our ears hear better, more dulcet sounds, clear, cleaner sound so that we have this wonderful uh, looking for an adjective, enjoyable experience. Let's see, be better communicators of their message. All right, our two minutes are up. Thank you for all of that input. We have a lot of people with a lot of ideas. So make sure you copy and take away what you wrote here because you're going to be able to use this when we get done today. All right, uh, let's go for some questions because we just had an exercise that might, it might have been easy for some and perhaps had some people scratching their heads. So do we have any questions? Okay, we have so a good. question from Carol Fenway and as a small business owner, she's having problems with help removing some good recommendations from clients because of an algorithm and yet Yelp is then asking her to place ads. Any suggestions on dealing with Yelp? Carol, I am not an expert in Yelp and there are some social media experts out in the universe that I, I strongly encourage you to tap into. I'd be uh, uh, practicing without a license here if, if I try to to answer you on that particular item. I believe there are some very specific answers and I wish I had the answer, but I, you, you think you really should get somebody who, who really knows Yelp. And uh, if you get in touch with me afterwards, I'm, I would be happy to look around for somebody who's an expert in that. So, so make sure you, you get my email and then we can communicate afterwards and make sure that you get an answer. Let's see. Naomi asks, how can introverts build their brand? So, so Naomi, um, believe it or not, most actors, most professional speakers, many writers and people who get in front of the spotlight are introverts. Uh, they're great un, you know, under the spotlight and then they go into their caves, hide under their beds when they go back, uh, when everything is done. I realize that doesn't answer your question exactly. It just lets you know that there are, th this is a very common phenomenon. And I would say that I would not let being an introvert affect what you decide to do. Just be aware that certain things, maybe some of those barriers and fears that we talked about earlier may be getting in the way. So just look at ways that you can do we want to say talk yourself out of them, perhaps? Just, just be aware of that. 
However, there isn't a different pathway for an introvert. The pathway is exactly the same. It's just understanding that you have that barrier. And as sometimes they say in, in meditation and Buddhism, notice it and then try and let it move along and move away from it. And not to be attached to the fact that you're an introvert, because I'm sure you've got some really great qualities about you that are aching to get out, but you've got this little thing inside of you that says, I'm an introvert, how could I ever do this? I know you can. All right. How can you manage your brand to stop being bullied? Well, you know that we talked about earlier about reputation, that, um, that if there is, if there's facts, factual information that's, that's up online, then that's incorrect, you can have it taken down. If you're actually being bullied and there's no factual, it's just an opinion, you can make a decision either to engage with the bully or to ignore the bully, depending on how visible your brand is and how well known. Uh, you, you'd have a choice. Of course, the more well known you are, being silent does not help. So you would need to come up with some kind of a statement. But if you're really a relatively unknown brand, ignoring it uh, may be the best prescription for this. Okay, let's see here. What tools are effective to gather uh, what you project as a brand? We're going to be going over that in our, probably I would say our final step when we're looking at, um, at our content and action plan. So if you can wait until then, we'll have a good answer for that. I'd like to know how to bring our personal values to our professional field as reputation, I believe also depends on the choices we make while building our brand. Absolutely, you bring your personal values because you always have to be true to yourself. If you're inauthentic or you're hiding a part of yourself, it, it just doesn't make sense. So however you can bring that truth and make it relevant, if it's not relevant, if, it, if it's a true part of you, but really isn't relevant to the brand you're building, then it's okay to keep it separate, but never compromise what you stand for, okay? How are we doing with uh, time on this? I think you may be close to time. Okay. All right, let's uh, move on. <clears throat> now, in interestingly, as I was answering those questions, I had actually planned to speak over this and I just want to read you a few things that uh, I had hope to say, and I think are, will help you along. So this is again, still talking about your purpose. Um, it's not about making more money and it's not about having more free time. It's not about you. Again, it's about how you make others better off. What pain are you going to help eliminate for them? What can you do or, or you're already doing that's going to help them sleep better at night? And for those of you who didn't write anything down, you can imagine your purpose if you don't have one yet. And then the last thing I did want to say about this is that when your colleagues understand that you're focused on making even a small corner of the corner of the world a better place, your standing in their eyes is going to shoot through the roof. And that happened with, with my client earlier when she just decided in the end to write her opinion piece. It was an overnight change. All right, I shall close the Q&A here. And now we are getting on to a seven step to building your personal brand. We're going to combine steps two and three, which is what you want to be known for in core message. Because when you've got your brand purpose pretty much figured out, and you know what you want to be known for, which is what we're going to work on right now. Number three, your core message is practically going to write itself. So let's look at what, our, what we're known for. And of course, then that feeds into our core message. Close your eyes or keep your eyes open and ask yourself, what do you want to be known for? 
how do people describe you when you're not in the room? Here's an example. Let's say you're a recruiter. If you tell the world, I source talent and I get people hired, it's correct. And it's not particularly inspiring. But imagine you tell this to the world. As a workforce matchmaker, I bring the right talent and the right employers together so that employees do their best work and advance their careers, while companies exceed customer expectations and build a loyal customer base. Now you've let people know how they'll be better off, what outcomes and value they can expect to get from you if they hire you or retain you, as a, from a, uh, retain you for their, you to, their to be your client, them to be your client or uh, for you to be an employee. So let's now do another exercise while we've got all these words and ideas and purpose flowing around in our minds. What do you want to be known for? And once again, I'd love you to share that in the chat. What do you want to be known for? If people are describing you when you're not in the room, what are they saying about you? I bring sports management to a high level that it brings peace to warring zones. Oh yes, look at that. What you do and its purpose to conflict zones, yes. Bringing out the full potential in people I'm a, that I'm a connector. Making a positive difference, being an effective and knowledgeable expert so that what happens when being that knowledgeable expert, how does that extend into what you want to be known for? What that purpose is. Remember, that purpose is always in what you want to be known for. I'd like to be known for bringing highly performing and happy teams to deliver legendary results. Improving the environment. Thank you, Beth. I know Beth. She's a, a good student. And she just quickly, one, two, three, was able to, to go th through that, so that, so that, and come up with her answer. Thank you, Beth. Bringing powerful partnerships together to make a mutually beneficial relationship that can synergize to change the world. Yes. Bringing value to the conversation. Jenny, she's from my Toastmasters, Townsend Toastmasters. Bringing value to the conversation. Jenny, so that, how would you answer the so that part of it? Being a problem solver that brings together people together for, let's see, it's running off my screen here. That brings people together for an, for an agreed to solution. Yes, yes, that's a good start there. I want to be known for bringing emergency housing to the Auraria campus so the students don't have to worry about where they will sleep or having a roof over their head while working towards their degree. Wow, that almost gets into Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If any of you remember that, where we have the needs, putting a roof over our heads is right at the base of the pyramid and then self actual and so that's the housing and the needs. And self-actualization is career. It's like, how can we be the very best we can be is what we do with our career. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That, that's a good one to, to think through as you're, as you're working your way through all of these uh, different pieces we're talking about today. How are we doing on time, uh, Laura? We're at time. We're two minutes are up. We are at time. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. Uh, we will have copies of the chat and I'm, I'm very excited to continue reading it. It's, it goes by so quickly with more than a hundred people on the call. So uh, I, I really look forward to, to seeing what, what else uh, people have said, what you've said. Okay, now we're going to do what I like to call an instant reputation audit. people find when they search your name online and when you search you see what they see think what happens after someone meets you in any business setting especially now during zoom meetings and on other platforms
people are going to look you up in an instant. You know, while you're sitting there talking to them on Zoom, they're already typing in, looking you up on LinkedIn and sending you a LinkedIn connection. What else are they finding about you? Now, LinkedIn very often tracks so that the first thing they find is your LinkedIn profile, which we'll get into in a moment. But right now, we're very interested in what does show up on that first page. Because what shows up on that first page is your online reputation. So what I'd like you to do is either on your computer now, or if you've got an iPad or, or any, any kind of device, your phone, just pull it up and go to your browser and type in your first name and your last name. Scroll through that first page and see what shows up. And also take a look at what doesn't show up. And once you have something to share, please share in the chat. I want to see what shows up, if my predictions are correct. All right, I'll start giving a little bit of this away. At least one person here today is going to find somebody with the exact same name. And you may find that there are two or three people who have your name. Then there are going to be some of you that you're searching on that homepage and your, your name isn't even showing up at all. So let me see. I've got to scroll down here. Let's, let's see what we've got. Facebook links. Uh, CC Edu, City Hawk Talk, Student Success, Single Mom, CCD. Okay, let's see what else we have. All right, do we have any other thoughts on the chat? YouTube videos, not seeing my married name, but showing my maiden name. Oh my God, I'm dead. My obituary was the first thing to show up. <laughs> Did you know that? That's the most important thing. Did you know that you were dead? Of course, you heard that a million stimulus checks were sent to dead people. Did you get two stimulus checks? That was in the news yesterday. A Twitter feed for somebody, LinkedIn profile, Pinterest searches, pictures from activities, and just my LinkedIn. Uh, somebody says, I am concerned. What are you concerned about? Profile from conferences, saw my valedictorian speech. So when we're thinking about building our reputation, if you're happy with what you're seeing, then fine. Start to build on it and add to it. Keep doing what you're doing because you like it. If you're not showing up at all on the first page, then just now you're going to have to start being more active and just posting some more. And we'll be talking about that in a while. And by being more active, whether in writing, but especially in videos, that's the way the Mostly Google algorithm is going to catch that you are alive and then start posting about you online. And if others with your name happen to show up before yours, you could consider adding a middle name or a middle initial or some people put their first name as an initial and then use their middle name only. And if you don't want to do any of the above, then what you're going to have to do is post so much and be really active so that your name rises above everybody else's. Let's take a couple of looks here. Quick question, do most people search names in, quest in quotation marks? Kat, I don't know. Years ago, we used to talk about uh, bo Boolean searches, and I think that then you had to put quotes around your name. What I suggest you do is put quotes around your name and search and see what shows up, and then do it without the quotes and see what shows up. And then do that with some keywords that have nothing to do with your name, you know, just, just like a regular search and, and see if there's a difference. I think that the, the proof might be in that uh, quote pudding uh, by putting the quote marks uh, around and then trying them without. And one we have here, let's see, I've been an amateur Latin dancer for the past 10 years. It's been my hobby while raising kids. I've not been in the job market once I go back to work. Will these photos and videos of myself dancing on Teams 
wearing skimpy clothing be a detriment to being hired again? Kai Van Lee, that I think would be a question to speak to a career coach and to potential recruiters. My guess, being from a completely different, different generation of most people who are doing the hiring, is that as hiring managers get younger and younger, they're going to realize that everybody has this stuff in their background. And when you're in school, you put all kinds of unquestionable, or question, excuse me, questionable stuff online that now makes you cringe. And my prediction is at some point, it'll become less and less important because of that generational shift. But for right now, I would consult with somebody in careers and, and hiring and some people who you trust and, and just check. I, I don't have a firm answer for you on that right now. And thank you for that excellent question. Let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> How does one go about removing incorrect or personal rather than business contact information? That's an excellent question. When it's incorrect, you can contact Google. And I don't exactly know offhand, but you could search their help. And there is a way you can send in the information to get it removed. And it will get removed pretty quickly. We're about just to clear time. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, again, if any of these questions didn't get answered, you should feel free to email me afterwards. Yes, I know there'll be lots of emails, but if you have some spe specific questions that you really want to get answered, we'll go for them, okay? All right, so we're gonna move on to step five, thought leadership and influence. I created this spectrum because I thought it would be really good to show the difference between what it means to be an expert and what it means to be a thought leader. Very often we hear the term thought leader thrown around in the workplace. People talk, people refer to articles as your thought leadership. And to some degree it is. I also tend to take a really more restricted or very fine line approach to how I define thought leadership. And here goes. Starting at the tail here of our spectrum, I know that everybody here on the call today is an expert in something and you're a really good expert in it. And you may find that there are lots of other people who do what you do. And what that means is that you're in a category of many. But then as you start to write and create content and get your name out there and have people commenting on what you're doing, Perhaps you conduct a survey and your name, you're an author on a survey. And perhaps you write a white paper, or like my client who had her opinion piece published. That now makes you distinctive. You've started to move away from everybody else who's great at what they do. However, now you're starting to stand out. The more you do this, Perhaps now you've got a book inside of you. At some point, you may even want to do a TED talk. But the idea about being a thought leader, as we said earlier, is that your goal and your aim is to really change others. Your aim is to change how people think and behave. And that's a pretty heavy lift. So that's why somebody who we refer to as, as a thought leader versus a thought, a thought leadership article. And I think you understand why I pay, place much more gravity on this concept of what it means to be a thought leader. <clears throat> so there's actually some research on, if we could have the next slide, there's some research about how our brains operate. As a thought leader, as we were just taught saying, we need our ideas to spread. Thought leaders need their ideas to spread. And spreading happens when people share your ideas and you get to, as a result of that sharing, you're going to influence others. It just so happens that some researchers down at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, for those of you not familiar with the California, excuse me, California UC system, <clears throat> they found that there's an area that are areas of the brain that are more active and actually light up 
when that part of the brain sees information that you want to share. It's the moment that you think to yourself, oh, oh I just got to share this with Alex or Tina just absolutely has to see this. This is how ideas and videos spread and go viral. And we don't, we don't even stop to think those thoughts. And I'm sure most people here have seen it and clicked share with any number of people when there was something that just hit you like that. If you've ever wondered then how certain videos or comments go absolutely bonkers in the millions online, then know that there's a part of the brain that's actually making it happen. And we have a wonderful example from somebody who was in my Toastmasters club a few years ago, and then he moved <clears throat> slightly out of the area. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> His name is Thomas Prayer. He posted in March an extremely long, well-researched article on COVID-19 to Medium. And if you're not familiar with it, Medium is a platform where people can post articles. His piece, get ready for this, scored more than 10 million views. Okay, this is somebody who was in our club and he started some businesses. He's an entrepreneur. He wrote an article on COVID that was very well researched. It had over 10 million views. And I believe last month he wrote another piece that also scored millions of views because now people already knew his work and were reading it and passing it along again. Millions of brains lit up and said, share, share this guy's work, share. True story, I wish I could make something like that up. So moving along here in our seven steps, the sixth step is to essentially build your content and visibility plan. Let's start with another topic that is so important to content. If I could have the next slide, please. All right, I'll just start reading. I'm hoping that the next slide will, will come up. Content that's thoughtful, shareable, and compelling comes in part from that place of curiosity inside of you. So we're talking now about curiosity. Being curious and having an inquiring mind gives you power. When you have knowledge, you have power. Being willing to know more builds your personal brand, your credibility and appeal as a go-to authority. And before I move on, I just want to double check whether we're having any issues with advancing the next slide. Yes, I am on the next slide, but I see that it is not advancing forward. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. So if you can just wait. Okay. While I do Pause that. everyone. Thank you. Sorry. It is technology. We are still in this massive human experiment of instead of being in Foster City at a hotel in a room crowded to the gills, jostling shoulder to shoulder, listening to our fellow speakers, Toastmasters, talking about all kinds of great ideas. Here we are online speaking to the world and having a good time, I hope. Okay. We have another, let's see what we're saying in the chat here. Charo says there's a big push to use virtual assistants to do some of this brand establishment and daily communication for new entrepreneurs, but I don't know how to utilize, utilize this resource effectively. What do you believe is the best purpose of leveraging VAs as a resource? Um, Charo, I think I've pronounced your name correctly. I just discovered that there are two different kinds of virtual assistants. There are virtual assistants who are actual people who you delegate the work to and you pay them and they're human beings and they they have a program and they work with you and help you with your with your branding and you know act like uh, assistant marketers and then there are the virtual assistants that are all digital so could you 
clarify whether you meant the digital version or the human version. You're referring to the live person, thank you. Uh, many of us have been using virtual assistants for a long time. And yeah, they, we do know them as VAs. And of course now the, the virtual world has, has uh, caught up with them. And we, we used to call them virtual or, or remote. The, the word virtual just uh, caught on. Use virtual, a virtual assistant for a lot of the mechanical and tedious things that you may not want to do, which is managing a database uh, putting up a template and managing your, let's say, a MailChimp or constant contact uh, mailing list for you. Uh, they can also schedule your social media. So if you've got some pieces that you've written, then you can use one of the platforms like Hootsuite, which is a scheduler, but instead of you going in and putting all of that in, the virtual assistant's going to do that. So you send that person all of your raw information, give them a few instructions and boom, Forget about it, they're going to do it for you. They'll check back with you if they have any questions. So excellent question. And if you have the opportunity to work with a virtual assistant, I would. Let's see. So Katrina, our slides aren't advancing. Is that what you're saying? Oh, here we are, yay. All right. I'll just make this a little bigger here. Wonderful. All right, so going back to being curious, it's really about wanting to know more and not being satisfied that you ever know enough because you can never really know enough. So let's go through the different points here because this is how you can actually, in a very targeted way, intentional way, practice curiosity. Be knowledgeable about your field. Well, you already are an expert. And what are you doing to ensure that you're really up to the minute? You know, in the latest developments, because once you know what's going on, then you can leverage or use that information to start creating your new content around it. And the more you do that, you make yourself more desirable to clients. You make yourself more desirable, perhaps for a new role you want to take on at work. If you don't already do this, I urge everybody on the call today to set up Google News Alerts to one or two or three topics, what, however many you want. And of course, you'll need to fine tune them because it's not perfect. But using keywords in your field or any topic that you want to know about, set up your Google Alerts, and then it'll start flowing into your inbox. Some of it's not going to be relevant or useful, but some of it actually will. Now, a close relative to being knowledgeable about your field is being knowledgeable about trends in your field. Let me give you an example of a trend. We're in the middle of COVID-19, right? And contrary to what people were hoping that it would just come and like the flu die off, that ain't happening. Looks like it's going to be around for a while. Has your industry crashed? And I hope not. Has it stayed the same or has it exploded since coronavirus embedded, embedded itself around the world? I've talked with colleagues who have clients whose industries have crashed, stayed the same and exploded. And in fact, I have one very close colleague who last week, he works in immigration and helping people with their green cards and, and uh, visas with the shutdown that the administration put on last week, he said to me, my business is essentially shut down. And just three months ago, he had a thriving practice of 25 employees in downtown San Francisco in a lovely office building. So there are industries that are being hit and there are industries that are thriving. The point being is when you know the trends, you can capitalize, when I say capitalize, you can use that, of course, in a sensitive way to write something new, an idea that you've had, and to just keep storing that and writing about it, thinking about it. And then when you speak with fellow employees or bosses or managers, you can say, for example, something like, did, did, you, hear, did you hear about this uh, in, in the trucking, uh, trucking that now California is 
going to require all trucks to be uh, pollution free? I have an idea about what that's going to mean for our industry. You're going to turn a few heads if you're in the trucking industry and nobody ever thought that you would know that that was about to come down the pike. And by the way, that was a little piece of news that I read yesterday or heard it somewhere. And I never imagined I would even use it until this very moment. And that's the value of being knowledgeable and paying attention to the news, just being a voracious reader and consumer and watcher and, and listener of news. Be a perpetual learner. If you ever stop learning, um, you're going to get stale and worse, you're going to be irrelevant. So be sure to embrace learning. And then watch from others and learn from others in your field. You can always learn so much. Uh, the next bullet, please. Is that, um, oh, it is working, good. <clears throat> Do you know who your peers and, uh, are? Do you know who your competition is? Just, just go and stealthily sleuth them. See how active they are. S look at the things that you like that they're doing and the things that you don't really care for, that you, you know that you would do differently. Just remember, knowledge is power and curiosity will always lead to that knowledge and that power. So uh, my team, I see that we're three minutes from our end. What do you propose that we do? Can we add a few minutes because of our delay? What's the consensus here? If people are willing to stay on, we can definitely add some time. Maybe we'll skip the next Q&A time. And if Roberta, you're willing to stay late, maybe answer a few questions after we've kind of wrapped it up for the recording. Um, I'd be absolutely happy to do that if, if everybody would. Perfect. So we'll just, One. we'll end it. We'll have a nice cutoff for the recording and then Roberta will have you come back on and answer additional questions. Thank, thank you, uh, Katrina. <clears throat> And we will have the email address uh, at the end of the webinar, too, that folks can follow up individually afterwards. And lots of people are saying they'd like to stay. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for confirming that, because I'd love to finish giving this to you. Thank you. Content that's thoughtful, shareable, and compelling comes in part from that a place of, oh, excuse me, I'm repeating myself here. Um, so here we are on the content and visibility plan. So the first item to do on the, this first uh, rung or step of, of our stair step here uh, is to review and update, update your LinkedIn profile. Remember earlier on reputation, we talked about that the first thing that when somebody searches you, they're likely to find LinkedIn because LinkedIn just has such great SEO or search engine optimization. So let's give them what they want, which is optimizing your LinkedIn profile really think of LinkedIn as a very valuable tool to help you shape your reputation. It, it offers many opportunities because it's how you can express yourself. And if you don't have a website, you can even use LinkedIn as a surrogate website for yourself. So here are the top things that I would like to suggest that you do on your profile. And this is after you've actually optimized the static portion, which is, you know, the about you, and, and all of the other pieces. Uh, we'll, we'll focus on other things here today. The first thing is, and I'm sure everybody here is doing this, you're going to comment on posts in your feed. You know, you like something, you click like, and you go in and reply to, to a comment that somebody made. And did you know that if you use their at LinkedIn at handle, their name should not only shows up, but they'll get a, a, an email saying that they've been tagged and then they can go and see what you said because otherwise they wouldn't necessarily know. So nice, a, a nice little feature that, that LinkedIn has put in there. The next two are more ambitious and this is where we now are getting more into the, that thought leadership realm. I want you to curate articles. Now the articles I'm talking about here is to find things that you like in mainstream media from publications online, it doesn't matter where they are, or it can be video. You're going to post it onto your feed. And in the post, instead of just saying, check this out, or I really like this, I want you to write a mini opinion piece about what you think about it, because you may like it, or you may have something else to add. Or you may think that something about it is misguided and you want your readers to know that you think it's misguided 
And of course you say it in a discreet way that how you think it could be a little bit different. And then the third, and I would say the most important piece that you can do uh, on the, the LinkedIn to giving your reputation a boost is to write your own articles and then curate them on LinkedIn. Now, when you write your own articles, you may post them on Medium. You could put them on a blog. If you have a website, put them on your own website. Medium is becoming more and more popular, so I would suggest having them in all of these places, especially in Medium. And then in LinkedIn, you curate the article, just like we did with other people's articles, and then link to wherever you want people to go to to read the article. And let's say you don't have a blog, you're not going to go onto Medium, you just don't want to set that up, but you just want to get an article going right away. So you can actually post your article within the article publishing area of LinkedIn and then just link from your feed to that article within LinkedIn. As we go up the visibility plan steps, now we're going to leave LinkedIn. I, I want you to think about an issue that's important to you and you know quite a lot about. And I'd like you to think about writing an opinion piece or perhaps a white paper. And maybe now is a good time for you to get quoted as an expert. And how about starting that book that you've always wanted to write? So again, as, you, as we go up each of these steps, we're looking at a slightly intensified degree of, of complexity. It doesn't necessarily mean that things are harder. It just means that you're corralling everything that you know and being much more, even more intentional about how you're, what we call packaging what you know and putting it out in different media, in different places, on different platforms, so that you get visible in a number of different places so that wherever you go, there you are and we see you. And we go, hmm, that person definitely has some things to say. I better check it out. So generally, each step does build on the previous step. And it's perfectly fine if you're doing a few things on each of the steps. So uh, what I didn't mention earlier is that at the end of this, of this program, there's going to be a link to a, a special page that I've put up for articles on curiosity, a couple of articles on curiosity. And this content and visibility plan is also going to be there. So it's three PDFs for you to be able to download uh, and, and use. So make sure that you uh, access them and, and use them for yourself. So don't worry about having to try to take notes here. All of that's going to be available. And like I said, two articles on curiosity. One is an actual article. The other is what I call my curiosity quotient. And you can just very quickly go down. It's a fun piece looking at how curious are you now? Let's see here. Now, for those of you on the webinar who are Toastmasters members, uh, a Toastmasters club is excellent for trying out new material in your topic. So as you're working through this visibility plan, content and visibility, vis visibility plan, and you're coming up with new ideas, please bring them to your club and into your presentations as you, as you go along your pathways um, program. It doesn't matter which, which path you're taking. And for those of you who aren't path, uh, Toastmasters, I really suggest you check it out. It's a wonderful organization uh, to both to get your feet wet and like I said, to practice a new material or to, to practice something in particular and, and see how the audience reacts because what you're getting is real feedback with no consequences. And it's the with no consequences as well that I really like uh, the aspect of. So you can easily visit a club by just uh, going online to the Toastmasters International website and looking for a club near you and then asking their, uh, emailing them and asking them to visit. All right, so we had to go past the questions and now we're onto the most, arguably the most important step of all. Don't get all the way through to looking at this plan and then stalling. You remember my clients, Lizard Imposter Brain? 
It almost stopped her from writing her first opinion piece on cyber breach. Muster that internal power from within yourself so that you say yes and you're able to override any reason you could give yourself to say no. I know it's hard to stay intentional and we all drift away now and then, but once you do it more and more, remember again, we talked right at the very beginning about dipping your toes in that freezing water. The more you do it, the more a habit it gets and it actually gets easier. Remember your purpose. You're on a mission to make the world a better place, even if it's a small slice of the world. It's your slice. So you're gonna focus on packaging what you know across different media, as we said earlier. Steadily put it out to the world and to your stakeholders, because I want you to make an intentionally get a reputation as a credible go-to authority in your field because you are making a difference and you will make a difference. So let's take a quick look at what we've covered today. We looked at the five W's of reputation. We dove into what reputation is, why it matters, who it impacts, when to act, and where your personal brand needs to show up. Then we did a deep dive into what personal branding looks like when you trip over it, the key traits and how your personal brand is gonna help shape and rock your reputation, and how you can maximize your appeal to prospective clients or for career advancement. And then we walk through the seven steps to build your personal brand. Step one, you establish your personal brand purpose, which as we've been saying a lot today is to make a difference in the lives of others in some way. Step two, you closely tied your personal brand to purpose, to what you want to be known for. This is where your reputation meets your purpose. What do people say about you when you're not in the room? And again, we want to aim for you to get your purpose and your reputation just really tightly aligned. Step three, we noted that your core message will spotlight your purpose and what you want to be known for, as well as what you actually do. So core message really now is how you communicate the words that you use to say what your purpose is, and what you do, how you do it, who you do it for, and how you make a difference. Step number four, we conducted an instant online reputation and you saw how others see you when you type your name in the search bot, in the search engine. And then in step number five, we delved into thought leadership and influence and how anything you do on the development spectrum, remember my purple arrow, is going to walk, work towards improving your standing as a go-to authority. In step number six, we looked in detail at the kinds of content you can develop and engage in and give your visibility a big boost. And we, starting with being more active on LinkedIn. And step number seven, plan it out and put it into action. I applaud you for investing in yourself and taking this journey today. It's, it's been wonderful to be spending this time with you. And it's, it's the beginning. And I know for some people, it might not be the beginning, you might be in the middle. And remember, we're always, this is always a process. We're always works in, works of progress, works in process of self-improvement. I'd say that you've launched yourself on a personal branding journey that's going to be yours for life. You're creative, you're intellectually curious, and you're a talented profession, professional. And with all of this, if you do the work, I know you're going to rock your reputation. With all of this, you're going to intentionally, purposefully, and consistently take action. It's going to advance your personal brand into shaping your future. And as you continue on with your life, it'll be with you forever. When you see and know your destination, you can shape your reputation. And now I have an announcement. Look at that. I'm offering a one hour free consult to the first 10 people to sign up. Not in the chat, you're going to have to send me an email and in the subject line put D number four free consult. Okay, so if you'd like a free one hour virtual consult, first 10 people to sign up. Okay. Now, if you don't want to consult or even if you do, occasionally I send out things 
And if you'd like to get those thought pieces, send me an email that says, in the subject that says D, number four, yes. And there's my email underneath. And now I have two more thoughts for you. It is Pride Weekend, and I am so proud. This is City Hall of San Francisco, lit up in rainbow colors. Uh, we have such a wonderful city here. We commemorate the San Francisco Giants, the Niners, and all different events with uh, Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah, and now Pride. And this is our Pride Weekend. Normally, we would have had a Pride uh, parade tomorrow. That's not happening. So to all my LGBTQ friends and allies everywhere, I do wish you a very happy Gay Pride weekend. And I want to give you a parting thought. Somebody asked earlier about being an introvert. Susan Cain, you may remember, wrote the book called Quiet, which was for introverts to let them know they're not alone. And for those who are not introverts to understand how to understand introverts. She also wrote this quote, which I think is just so apt. She says that everyone shines given the right lighting. Everyone shines given the right lighting. So my suggestion to you today is go away from here and find that right lighting so that you and each one of you out there can shine ever more brightly. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Also, please thank our production team today, Laura Hines and Katrina Jureen Myers, District 4's Toastmaster of the Year for 2019 and 2020. And thank you to all of you for attending today. Your attendance has been a treat for us, and I hope you've enjoyed your time this morning. Before we go, I think Kitsy asked if we could um, post the link to the handouts in the chat. Would that be possible? The link has been posted. Thank you. And so my final thought to all is please be safe out there. Wash your hands, wear your mask, and keep speaking up. Thank you for coming. And somebody asked if I'm going to be hanging out, and yes, I am. If Zonker is able to field Q&A questions, he can go ahead and tee them up for you. Uh, so we have a number of them. One was, is the goal of the talk today to have your personal brand and your reputation merge? And I think they see them as separate pieces. Yeah, I sort of break them down because when we're developing our personal brand, these are, these are actions that we can take and understandings that we can have that we control, whereas reputation is perception and where, that we can't control. If we were just to look at it on an objective basis, you, have a re you get a reputation for a particular personal brand. So in that sense, the two are sort of one and the same as, as they're developed. I hope that answered the question. I think it does. I'll go ahead and type that up into the answers. Another was how to leverage well-connected experts in your network when they're all involved in your current work to explore new employment opportunities. I don't want to sabotage my current job in the process. That was Beth Zonis. Ah, Beth. <laughs> How to, repeat the question again, how to, how to leverage all the people you know in your network? Yeah, you, 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 you experts, well, they're all involved in your current work. So I presume these are coworkers all doing something and she's got an idea for the next big thing. Right, well, in some cases, Beth, you, uh, you do have to go stealth. And I know you know this, that in some cases you, when you're looking uh, for a new employment opportunity, you have to do it quietly. So of course, so that nobody knows because it's, uh, it does become a challenge. And especially if you're saying that the colleagues you're talking about could be somebody who could hire you. 
um, there is going to be that risk that word could get out. I think you'd really have to get into a different niche, slightly different marketplace to be totally protected or much more, more protected uh, and not be, you know, not be exposed. I hope that answered the question. It's, it, um, I need to give that a little bit more thought and, and we, can t we can continue to explore that offline, Beth. Well, there is, as someone who is passionate about helping and building people, youth and teenagers, through social innovation and web development, what growth systems set to build my career online presence in order to achieve this? And how does character and personality come in with branding to accomplish my aims? You, you cut out at the very beginning. Uh, could you just read the first part again? Yes. This is from Gold Okimut. As someone who is passionate about helping other people, youths and teenagers, through social innovation and web development, what growth systems can I set to build my career online presence in order to achieve this? And how does character and personality come in with the branding to accomplish my aims? I think a lot of this was covered during the panel, during the seminar. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, and I'm actually seeing it now because it, it, this is sort of a, quite a, a complex uh, question. Well, I, I would like to start off by saying that if you, instead of thinking that you have a career, you really think of using that word personal brand instead of career, then everything that you're, you're right, Zonka, everything we talked about today will help you be able, if you go through all the different pieces, everything we talked about today will help you be able to methodically uh, message, come up with the messaging and the actions that you need to take that lets the world know about what you're doing. Uh, but you're looking at a growth system. And I think I'd like to know a little more about what you mean by growth system. Because that could mean a number of things. So if you'd like to clarify that, and then uh, we can take another question and go back to it. All right. Here's an interesting one to me. Nicole Perron says, I was I'm 17 too. years yeah. old. And I still have a lot to learn. Do you have any advice for teens like me. And I did reply directly when I saw that in the chat to try and build some confidence and ask questions and, and be an attentive listener to take notes. And maybe she'll find a mentor or at least get some good experience. What can you offer? Well, uh, that's a great answer that you, that you gave her. And here's, here's my answer, Nicole. And first of all, I'm thrilled that you're on. You might be our youngest person and that you're already asking these kinds of questions now at the age of 17. So I'm sure you could relate to Malala. Why don't you think about Malala? She had a passion. So think about something that you're already passionate about. And if you're not passionate about something, just let it, let it percolate. Just think about the things around you or in life that, that bother you. They, I mean, they may be small things, they may be big things because you may not know yet what kind of a career you want. Are you going to go into business? Will you perhaps be in the public sector? Uh, if, you're, um, if you're a citizen of the United States, you might have your eyes on the Oval Office. And I'm not laughing here. I think that every American citizen, especially girls, should ask themselves whether they'd like to be president at a very young age, because at the age that you are, you're in a perfect time, your perfect situation to really start uh, building those things in, your, in, in yourself and, uh, and your networks around you to help you achieve your goals. One thing I didn't mention is that we rarely do this alone. We, we're always going to have mentors and coaches and people around us and just advisors uh, and people who just believe in what we're doing and, and very often want to help. So think in terms of that, Nicole, of starting off, okay, Malala had that deep passion. Is there, is there something that I have like that, or not like that, or just something local? I mean, it, it really could be anything. 
And even if you're just, in, let's say you're avid in building, uh, you're into robotics, or you just love engineering and making things, just think again. And I know your generation does this because I've met some, some people just a couple of years, uh, young women older than you, 20, 21, had long, long conversations with them. And they've been very clear to me that whatever they do, they're saying it has to be for a useful purpose. I, they say, if I'm going to build something, it has to be that I'm making something for somebody else that it's really going to help them and make them better off. I mean, your generation is already saying these things that, you know, people much older than you have only really now just started thinking about. So kudos to you. I know this is a long answer, but I hope that along with what, um, with what Zonkra said, if you have any doubts, um, just pull that thing inside of you and keep telling yourself, yes, we all have doubts. The trick is to try once you recognize a doubt to move it aside and just go, let that, let your compass, let that internal compass guide you to where you want to go and then do the things that you need to do in order to achieve the first goal and the next goal, etc. along your journey. Let's see, what else should we ask? Ed Coleman has asked, any other suggestions on how to influence your reputation if it's not what you want? For example, in my last job, I got known as the data girl and go to for anything Excel spreadsheet related. I'm data driven, but I'm not a data analyst. Oh, I just love this question. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing and smiling here because as women, very often we're known as the doers and very, and so we've been pigeonholed as the people, the, the people who get things done. And that's why I'm encouraging a lot of women to stop saying, I get things done because we, what we really want to do is, is to get known as people who have very um, ideas and thoughts that make change. So go back to what we talked about today about publishing and start publishing your ideas. And then all those people who see you as a data analyst, they're going to see you, start to see you as a thinker about data. So what kind of thoughts do you have around data? What kind of thoughts do you have around organizations that use data or how people use data? How, how are data being used now today? You know, we know all the different privacy issues. Um, I'm just trying to think. Pri privacy is probably the one that's, that's in our faces, you know, more on, on sort of the negative side. But then on the positive side, let, let's even take a look at COVID-19 is that unfortunately, nationally, data aren't being used the way they should be. But locally, there are some amazing things that are being done with data. And so your, your goal is to look at all of these different pictures about data, how it's being used, who's using it, and to what outcomes, and to start to formulate your ideas around it, communicate it, write about it, speak about it, and people will start to see you as that person and not as that person whose head is down being the analyst in head in the keyboard all the time. So I hope that helped. You've touched on a very particularly personal uh, topic for me. So thank you for the, asking that. We've got one that looks like it's revisiting somebody else's question. And, and I think that one's already filed, but Mark Prince writes, mm. I'd love to hear the answer to Stuart's question from before. What if you don't consider yourself an expert or specialist in any one area, but a generalist across several, perhaps unrelated areas? Uh, that resonates with me, but what would you like to say? Well, here's what I'd like to say. <clears throat> you probably are an expert in each of those areas, even though you're, and, and to varying degrees. And this is sort of part of a question because what if you don't consider yourself an expert? Uh, the part of the question that's missing is what you wish you could do. And I would, you know, once you find out, and if it's, if it's around thought leadership, I would assess all of the different areas that you know you're really good at, and as you say, a generalist in, and have a fair amount of expertise. 
and look at the one that really lights your fires the most. <laughs> What's the one that really makes you, you just, you just gravitate towards it. You just feel the most comfortable in it. Your skin just feels smooth when you do it. And that might be the one where you really want to, to be the standout and become known as, the, as an authority in that particular area. It, it does become really challenging. You know, I've got some clients, well, I want to be known for this, I want to be known for this, I want to be known for this. How do I get all of that into my brand? And of course I have to say, well, I have to get back to you in five minutes and think about that. But no, truthfully, we really can't unless we can make a logical connection and show the threads that this is a place where X intersects with, uh, with Y. And then you've got two topics that normally separately would, we would say, well, are you about X or are you about Y? You can't really be about both because our brains tend to want to put people in lanes. And so we're always advised, pick a lane, stay in your lane, don't veer out of your lane. And the reality is, you know, we're human beings and we feel, you know, we get that FOMO, fear of missing out. We just don't want to stop all the other stuff. And I, I still go through it myself, uh, just coming up with the brand called Rock Your Reputation. And it was interesting because as I looked at the title of the presentation that I'd given, it was Rock Your Personal Brand. And I'm thinking, hmm, why did I do that? And I still don't have the answer because that, that was a few months ago. And so it's this process of evolution of, of we're always refining our brand. And I really am in a, in a process right now of refining my brand and pulling disparate pieces together. Just like the question earlier was um, about the brand and personal brand and reputation coming together. Is there, is there a point at which they merge? Uh, Yes, like I said, yes, they, they do come together. They're, you do want that alignment. And it, what I was talking about, of course, was, was, the, was two separate sort of sub-brands. Um, so I hope that answers that question, that it really depends on what, you know, what lights your fire and then use that as, as your, your core topic that you want to explore. And then you may find that those other things that you're a generalist in, some of them may fall under the umbrella of, of that core topic. Thank you, Roberta. I've got three that I think are related and, and if you're willing to try and pull on that thread, uh, I'll try and run them quickly since there is a, a theme. Okay. And that is, I don't want my brand to be only related to my work. How do I find the intersection sweet spot between my personal and professional brand? And should they be the same or separate? The second thread is how can you build a network or connections in a new area other than your current career? And how do you find mentors and advisors? I think these all run together and it's coming right off the end of this last question. Do you see any fertile ground for that? Um, I'd like to take each of them separately because each one actually does have a separate answer. So the first one was the professional brand and the personal brand. Should they be the same or separate? How do you find an intersection or sweet spot? Well, the, this is a very interesting question because I've been talking about pers personal brand here and I sometimes use the term professional brand because that's just the way the nomenclature came about in, in the marketplace. And so essentially the way I would use those two, they actually mean the same thing. We say personal as to differentiate ourselves from a corporate brand. But really, if you think of your personal brand as your professional brand, now you can see how you don't actually have a logo for yourself as an individual, but you have all of those traits. Remember we talked about the traits. So we, there are different manifestations of your brand. One of the manifestations is before you even open your mouth, how do you show up? You know, before I opened my mouth, you saw me sitting here in a red jacket. You, 
you didn't know yet what was going to happen except, oh, there's a woman in a red jacket. Oh, there's a powerful jacket. Yeah, mm, this is going to be some presentation today. Uh, and I've had that said to me, the, the red jacket. Oh, okay, so I'll wear red jackets and it'll look powerful. And I did, that's why I wore the red jacket too, because it's a, you know, for a woman, it's a, supposedly a power statement. So if any of you on the call thought that, ah, so did I. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, like I said, it's, it's before we open our mouths and then when we start to talk and just the way we speak our diction, the way we articulate words, the words we actually use, do we seem really purposeful when we speak on our, you know, is our, is our speech, are our speech patterns sort of kind of, all over the place and we're hard to understand, we sort of just give people an impression that, that we're not precise. So that would be one thing about a brand that if I spoke that way, you'd get, you might not know the exact reason why something didn't feel right, but it wouldn't feel right. So anyway, all of those impressions, that's part of our personal brand, impressions. Then as part of our personal, and let me do personal slash professional brand, is all of the content that we start to put out, the writing, the videos, uh, and getting publicity, you know, getting quoted by the media, all of those different pieces also make up what we know as our personal brand and what people think about all of that and how they relate to it. That's your reputation. So I hope that answered the question because as an individual, when I walk in my home, or if I'm, if this is what you meant, personal brand, just as an individual human being, I, it's not something I'm really familiar with in our personal lives, whether that would be, um, whether that's something one would want to aspire to. I mean, yes, I mean, you know, I interact with my neighbors and I guess I'm always a little on because I'm, who knows where the next opportunity is. So in a sense, that personal brand or professional brand, it's, it's, it's always there, even, uh, even when I'm in my pajamas. But then my neighbors only see me down to the neck. They don't see the rest. <laughs> All right, the next question was? That was, how can you build a network or connections in a new area other than your current career? you would start to build a network outside of your career once you know what area you want to build them in. Let me give you an example. All my life I'd called myself a feminist and uh, didn't realize what I didn't know. And I stumbled across the American Association of University Women. I thought, oh, this would be a good organization to uh, might be a good organization to get associated with. And then suddenly I found myself writing opinion pieces uh, using their name, using my name, and, and I forget who the copyright was. But I suddenly started understanding the issues that, that women were dealing with across society. And I thought, boy, I really need to get involved in this. And I didn't know where to start. So, I just went online and started and looked for organizations and dabbled a little bit here, dabbled a little bit there. And when I say dabble, I would go to a meeting or two. And when I discovered that the meetings were of women getting together, but that their focus wasn't women's issues, I learned to get out of there because I was really focused on being around other people who focused on issues, women's issues, issues around children, uh, and, and families. So in that, and, and I, like I said, I went, I went down a lot of false paths trying to get there. So what you need to do outside of uh, your current uh, career area is know what it is or a network that you want to, you want to create for yourself and then start to look for where people are actually hanging out and start exploring those, but also know your end goal. Because if you don't know your end goal, you, again, you, like me, you may go down some of those paths where the right type of people were there, but their, their mission wasn't the same thing. They, they didn't have the same um, outcomes that you were looking for. And what was the next one? Uh, the finally, how do you find mentors and advisors? 
and we do have a few other questions after that. Okay, mentors and advisors. Let's, let's, let's start, well, sometimes they can be very similar. Advisors are a little more casual than mentors. Again, it's, I'm going to assume that you know you've, what you want to be mentored in and you know what you want to be advised in. So we're going to go into that assumption. Some people put together what's called an advisory board. And they look for individuals that are different. However, have they, they you know, they, they're diverse. They bring different ideas to the table. However, they're rooting for you and they want you to succeed and they're willing to put in a little effort. And then, you know, once a quarter, you can convene your advisory board and let, you know, work with them, let them know what you, how you want them to help you and work with you. And of course, always be willing to reciprocate. Just want to throw that out there. Some people are very generous with their time and, and their efforts. So we always have to be willing to, to know to give back. Um, and look within your network. That's, that's a really good place to start. With mentors, uh, it's the same thing. It can be looking within your network. Um, on the other side of my life, I have a, on the other side of my life, it's, it's a very big part of my life. I have a nonprofit that I founded to close the gender gap in tech. And one of our, one of the parts, one of the parts of our mission is to help match technical women, uh, women who are starting out in their tech career. And most of these are women who don't have a technical background, but they've been to coding boot camp. They come from another career. And we determined they really need a couple of different kinds of mentors. One would be a, a technical career, a, a technical mentor to help them really get better with their technical skills. And then another one for career. There are some actual mentor networks, both in tech and outside of tech. And if you get in touch with me afterwards, I can go into digging in my database and find that information. There's a group that's called Million Dollar, Million, Dollar, Million Women Mentors. And they do mentor matching. There are some platforms where you have to pay. And then if you go to a lot of events where there are panels with experts and you really like one of the, the, the panelists, develop a relationship with him or her and then just pop the question after a little while and say, would you be willing to mentor me? And they may get back to you and say, yes, or it depends. Let me know what you want. So, I think as, as Zonker said earlier uh, to Nicole, and I'll say again, is always being willing to ask the questions or the, uh, a question or the question, because we never know what's, you know, what the answer is going to be. Uh, so, so beyond actually researching it is, and I know sometimes it can be a little uh, scary to go up to somebody and say, I've heard, so you heard somebody in a panel who said, you know, I've, I've, I've been hearing about you so much. I've been following you online. And I'd love to speak with you at some point about you being a mentor. Is that something you ever do with people? So, you know, sort of soften, soften the question a little bit. So I hope that helped with that answer. Thank you, Hello. Roberta. Robin has ask oh go ahead i just wanted to say hi to pinky uh who's, ah. who's on the call there's lots of people i know who are, who are on this so i'm just so excited it's it's wonderful she said if i can just ask this how how do you get a sponsor compared to a mentor um pinky if you're talking about a sponsor within a company this is such a wonderful question and i believe it's at the center for leadership excellence i'm blanking on her name she wrote a book on on uh, on sponsorship about three or four years ago a woman back east and the book is on sponsorship and it differentiates from a mentor where a mentor 
again, again this, is in, this is in the workplace, this is in a company, where you get a mentor who's going to help you with, with what you're doing now. However, a sponsor is somebody who is influential within the company and can open doors for you. And they're going to essentially groom you. They have your success uh, at stake. So if you were to screw up, it could look badly on them. So a sponsor is definitely a much more serious investment uh, than a mentor is. I wish I could remember the name of the woman uh, who wrote the book on, um, on sponsorship. But anyway, it, it is out there. And I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Go ahead, Zonka. Well, uh, Robin asks, do I use my legal name, Chang Lee, or the name I'm known by, Robin Lee, or a hybrid, Chang Robin Lee? Most know me as Robin Lee. Documents are under Chang Lee. Oh dear, Robin, I'm going to guess that when you search on your name, the pages are full of Chang Lees and Robin Lees. Um, Chang Robin Lee. I would start off by doing a search, Robin, and see what shows up. And the one that has the fewest of the name, uh, you may want to consider, uh, I don't think that you can trademark it, but establishing your uh, a domain name with your name, if you can, if there isn't a Chang Robin Lee or a Robin Chang Lee, so I would search that, and uh, I hope you I hope you've signed up for a free one hour consult because we could uh, we could explore that together online and see what makes sense for you. It's you've got you've got a very interesting dilemma there. And Denise Chen has been patiently waiting. Uh, my peers are mainly staying connected on Facebook to keep themselves visible. But I have very mixed feelings and complicated feelings about Facebook due to their questionable ethical practices. My real feeling is to boycott Facebook, but that's all people in my industry used to connect. Um, so there isn't exactly a question here, but I'm going to assume that the question is, should I be on Facebook, even though I find it, um, I just don't want to be there because it's, it's unethical. I think you have to go, you have to go with your ethical and moral compass. Uh, if your peer, well, if your peers are on Facebook, are those the people you need to impress? Or is it others? who you need to impress. When I say impress, be, be visible, really, excuse me. <clears throat> so don't go where your moral compass, your ethical compass says not to go. There are other options. Yes, there are a lot of people who are on Facebook and you can be just as successful without being on Facebook. Okay, uh, we have a quick follow up from Storyteller uh, asking if you were referring to the book called Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor by yes. Sylvia Ann Hewlett. Yes, 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 thank you. I knew it began with an S. Thank you. Yes, that is the book. Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor. Uh, I, th I think that's a little dramatic uh, because not everybody's going to be able to get a sponsor. It really depends what stage you are in your career. And definitely starting out with a mentor, if you've never had a mentor before, hopefully you find a mentor who holds your feet to the fire and gives you good practice. To It'll be sort of like, you might say, training wheels, but it would be good to work with a mentor before you work with a sponsor. A sponsor is a very heavy lift. All right. Uh, let's see. Chandra Peck wanted to ask for an elaboration on the advisory board. Is that the same as a board of directors? If not, how do they differ? Oh, what I, I love that question. A board of directors, whether a public organization 
I know more about the, a private organization, you know, a, a nonprofit. Uh, these are people who have either been appointed and they have a fiduciary responsibility. They're covered by an organization's um, um, directors and officers insurance. So they have much more of a legal obligation to an organization. So board of directors is a legal entity, whether for a nonprofit or for a uh, for profit. And an advisory board is essentially, it's called a board just to make it sound fancier, but it's people who have very, very little to no skin in the game at all and no legal liability and they're not covered by any of the insurances that a board would be covered by. Thank you very much. An anonymous attendee has noticed the repetition of no destination, shape reputation. What helps you with visualization and putting actions into ideas? Oh, it's such a beautiful question. Let me see how, how I can answer that. Well, if you're somebody who do like, does like to visualize, you could imagine, imagine a day in your life, let's say six months from now, How many invitations to be quoted um, from the media do you have? Do you have a TED talk scheduled? How many videos have you loaded on, uploaded, you know, and, and have, have done of yourself? Uh, whether you work for a company, have you been promoted? If you have clients, have your, has your client base either grown or become more, um, that you're getting more per client, uh, as it were. I hope that answers uh, the question because I, I use that uh, repetition so that people will understand that having an intention is what's going to get you wherever you want to go. And where you want to go, if it is shaping your reputation, when you stay on that path, your reputation will shape, become shaped as you go through those different steps. Always remember that reputation by itself is 100% out of your control. So it's all of the things that you do the right things that you do or the, when I say right, it means being visible in as many places as possible for a purpose. The purpose we talked about and also because you're, you definitely want to, to get to a particular place or to see yourself on a particular trajectory. We don't want to say a particular place because then you don't want to be in a situation like George Leonard says, this wonderful book called Mastery. I, I urge everybody to pick up that book, George Leonard, Mastery. I read it 20, 30 years ago. And he talks about being a, a black belt, but that what being a black belt is, it's all about mastery. And he shows how we, we get a little better and then we plateau and we get a little better and we plateau and we get a little better and we plateau. And then once you think you've reached the top of the mountain, where is there to go? the only place to go is down. So don't think of something as got to get there, got to get there, got to get there, got to get there. Okay, I got there, now what? But look at it as a process of mastery and self-improvement and continuous improvement of self. And then I think that concept of knowing or seeing your destination is going to help shape your reputation. So I hope anonymous attendee that uh, that helped and if you'd like to reveal yourself if you haven't already for a virtual consult um i'd love to delve a little deeper into that with you thank you for roberta that was a terrific question but you put a bow on the q a session with that answer uh, a lot of good points in there and i like the idea of always continuing to try and learn and improve 
Thank you all for your attendance today. And for those of you who stayed on to the end, there are some good links that have been posted into the chat portion as we've gone on this second section. Again, please be safe out there today. Wash your hands, wear your mask, and keep speaking up.